So earlier this week, I had a, had a woman call me up. She doesn't, uh, doesn't go to the church, but she and I know each other through the association, and she said, I need to talk to you. Can I come in? Sure. So she stopped by the office, and she said, I'm having a really hard time this week. Now, there are some individuals in my church who I have known forever. She's gone to this church for, I would say, 10, 15 years. And she said, I, I've known them for a very long time, and they are people who I trust. They are people who I respect. They are people who I deeply value. I hang out with them not during church time. Like, I like them. And she said, 10 days ago, they did something that I just can't get over. They did something that was horrible. They did something that was wrong. They called a secret meeting, and they ousted our pastor. And I can't take them anymore. And, and it was like as she was talking that I was picturing this relationship that they have built. And they've built one over time. They've built one of trust. They've built one of respect, of, of mutually caring about each other. And when her friends sinned, and they did, it was like everything in that relationship crumbled. And we went from this beautiful relationship to nothing but rubble, right? So she said, Pastor, I had to come and I had to talk to you because I can't talk about this in my church. She said, so I'm here to tell you that I am angry. And her next words were, and I know I'm not supposed to be. And I thought, oh, sweetheart. <laughs> so the first part of our conversation was, why wouldn't you be angry? God's angry. When people hurt each other, our God gets angry. He looks at people treating each other the way that you're describing and the rubble that came of a relationship, and he gets angry. So if you're made in his image, and you love what he loves, and you hate what he hates, you're about to get angry. That's okay. As a matter of fact, it's good. If she had sat there and said, all this took place, and I feel nothing, I would have said, I'm not convinced you had a relationship. <laughs> I'm not sure what you had. So the first part of our conversation was just really saying, anger's okay. Because the reality is that what anger does is say, something went wrong, right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Anger is this, this gift, this warning sign that God gives us that something that was good and beautiful is broken. And it is often the sign that what was supposed to be a safe relationship just got reduced to rubble. Now, God's desire, right, with anger is that we would look at the rubble and say, somehow, this rubble needs to be remade. It needs to be built into a road. A road that makes it possible for me and the person who I'm angry with to make it all the way to the cross. So that together we can come. Together we can be humble before Jesus Christ. Together we can be forgiven. And together we can even be reconciled. But as I'm sitting there, and I was having this conversation with this woman about the things that were going on, I got to tell you, we weren't building a road. <laughs> and the more she started to talk about her friends, uh, her former friends, the more that she discussed uh, what they had done, and her blood started to boil, we didn't build a road, but we surely started to build a wall. Right? The more that she was talking about it, the more it was like she was describing them on the other side of this wall, saying, I, those people, they're, I don't even want to see them anymore. I don't want to see them. I don't want to talk to them. You better believe they were supposed to come over to my house for dinner next week. That just got removed. And this wall that she's building got taller and taller and higher and higher, and I get it, I understand it, it's justified, and yet, at, at some points, she stopped building the wall, and she just started picking up some of the rubble. And you know what she did with it? Pay attention. Good job. <laughs> you got to make sure they stay awake. She was taking that rubble. Good cat. Well, block, anyhow. She just started taking that rubble and just started naming them by their sin. <laughs> Lori's going, my heart's in good shape today. She started, it was almost like she was picking up the rubble and just throwing it. If they'd been in the room, I think she'd have thrown it at them. Saying, naming them by their sin, they're nothing but liars and gossips and cheats, and I can't stand them. And the wall just went higher and higher. The thing of it is, though, there was a second wall being built. One I'm not sure she saw. One that gets built, frankly, every time I start to get really angry with somebody. 
Now, it was a wall that wasn't separating her from her former friends. It was a wall that was starting to separate her from God. Because, you know, the more angry I get, the more I let anger become not just this warning sign that there's something that is amiss, but the more I let anger become this major dilemma in my own life, the more anger separates me not just from the person I'm upset with, but from God. Right? Isn't that what Jesus was talking about? We were in Matthew chapter 5 two weeks ago. And the first part of Matthew 5 is where Jesus says, anybody who acts like his brother is dead is subject to judgment, right? Anybody who names his brother by his sin is going to be answerable to the Sanhedrin. And anybody who lives a a go-to-hell life, you know, the kind of life that says, you're over there, and I will make certain that you see more of Satan in me than of Jesus, right? The go-to-hell lifestyle is the one that says, today you will not know forgiveness or grace or mercy. You won't know compassion. You won't know love. As a matter of fact, a go-to-hell lifestyle is one that even says you won't know wrath. God's wrath is actually his white-hot love that he directs right at us and says, I'm going to show you your sin so I can melt it away. Sometimes I live that go-to-hell attitude just by simply ignoring people and saying, you and the mess that is you, have a great time. And we build up a wall. The reality is, friends, and, and I hope we can see this, that when anger gets out of control, it makes it impossible for me to love God or to love my neighbor as myself. Period. That's why it's so serious. That's why Jesus makes a point out of saying, when anger just grows and grows and grows, it's not just that I get cut off from the people who I'm upset by, I get cut off from him. Every time. So what do we do? Now the gospel is really clear. God's word is exceptionally clear because that passage continues and says, therefore, if you remember that your brother or your sister, you remember that somebody has something against you, okay? Jesus flips it. He says, you remember that you're the one over here and somebody is over there and they are upset with you. They're angry about something they think you did or that you did do, something you said or you didn't say. What are you supposed to do? Go. Go to them and be reconciled. Period. We're going to see next week that in Matthew 18, Jesus says, when I'm the one in the middle and I'm upset over something that I think somebody did or they did or whatever the case may be, if I'm the one stuck here in Matthew 18, he's going to say, go and be reconciled. God's desire, right, for anger is that it would show us that a relationship just got reduced to rubble so that we would take the rubble and we'd build a road that lets us go to them and together go to Jesus so we can be reconciled. But nine times out of ten, Christians, what we do is we take the rubble and we build walls. Some that are intentional, some that are just byproducts. And yet, there they are. Now, I show us this because I think we need this picture in our minds. We've got to realize and understand that this is exactly what happens. It happens every time I get angry with somebody. There's this huge walls, sets of walls, that makes it so I cannot love God and I cannot love my neighbor as myself. So somehow I've got to get to this point where reconciliation can take place. Now, I was thinking about it this week and I thought, well, great, so I'm just going to preach a sermon about getting reconciled. And what I'm going to do is say, knock down the walls, get reconciled, just be done with it. And that sounds nice. And then I thought about my own world and thought, that's never not one time ever happened. (laughs) So why would I expect it for anybody else? Reconciliation is this kind of funny word, right? To reconcile, uh, could you give me the next slide, sir? Thank you, sir. The word for reconciled, right, in the Greek language, there's two words that we translate as reconciled, and they both boil down to the same thing. If you're going to literally kind of wooden translation, it means on the basis of or through exchange, okay? To be reconciled to somebody on the basis of or through 
exchange. Because the word, Doug, when uh, it was being used in Jesus' day and age, was often a political term. It would refer to uh, two warring countries, or two warring parties, or two warring people. And to be reconciled was to exchange hostile relations for friendly terms, okay? That's why we got the word. That's where it comes from. It's this idea of restoring relationship, hopefully even better than it was, when we exchange the hostility for friendly terms. The reality is that if I'm really angry with somebody, I'm hurt by what they did, um, justifiably so. I'm mad. I'm sad. You pick your favorite. I'm frustrated. The last thing I want to do is take down the walls that I have built up that keeps the person that's really irritating me away from me and be reconciled. Because reconciliation implies relationship. Reconciliation implies we have to work at this. And some of you in this room, you are amazing at honoring the Lord in this. I am not. What I prefer is the walls. I will be nice behind the walls, but I still don't want to be reconciled to you. And the reality is that in order to get to the point where I can take those walls down and I can turn the rubble into a road, I need to do some work on the front end. You see, we're going to talk in the next couple weeks about reconciliation. And let me give you a couple headlines. We're going to talk about the fact that reconciliation requires acknowledging the rubble. You know, I cannot be reconciled to you if I choose to just sort of trip over the mess we both just made here. That don't work. Reconciliation only happens if we acknowledge the rubble, both of us. And reconciliation, for that reason, requires at least the two people involved. It cannot be just me or just you. We have to be in agreement that we're going to do this together. Which means that sometimes the best I can do is be willing to be reconciled. And I won't actually be able to be reconciled if the other person says I won't do it. If the other person says there's no rubble, how do we rebuild? If the other person, every time we rebuild, just knocks it over again, then there's going to come a point where I'll have to say, I'm willing when you change. But before we can even get to the point where we're talking about going to each other and being reconciled, I need to confront those walls. Not with you, just with me. Because the truth of the matter is, I am unwilling to be reconciled to somebody else until I deal with the walls. So today, we're not going to talk about going to the person we're upset with or the person who's upset with us. We're just going to talk about what has to be exchanged. See, somehow this rubble has got to get turned into a road. And the best way I know how to do that is just me and Jesus. So what I'm going to ask you to do today is turn not to Matthew 5. We'll go there next week, but to Philippians 4. So open your Bibles with me, Philippians chapter 4. What we're going to outline in Philippians 4 is, is really just five points. And there are five exchanges, five things that have to take place in our minds, in our hearts, uh, sometimes in our conversations, to be able to take the rubble that I've turned into this wall that's keeping me from loving God and loving my neighbor into a road. We're not even going to talk about walking said road today. Just moving the rubble so that we could clear a way that reconciliation could take place. So Philippians chapter 4, we're going to pick up in verse 4. But let me give you some background here. If you were to back up to verse 2 of Philippians chapter 4, you would find two names that I cannot pronounce and I'm not going to try to. So we're going to give them new names. We're going to call them Eunice and Cindy, because those I can say. <laughs> Are you looking at them? You can't pronounce them either. Thank you. Verse 2 of chapter 4. See, they can't pronounce it. Paul, and you've got to remember the, the premise of the book of Philippians. It's a book that was written to a church. It's a book that would have been read out loud in the middle of the church service. So Paul writes this letter. They read the first three chapters. You get to this point in it, and all of a sudden, whoever's reading the letter probably turned red because they said, um, uh, well, uh, Eunice and Cindy. 
Go with it. Paul says that he is praying that you be reconciled, that you would agree with each other in the Lord. It tells me that we've got two people in this church, Eunice and Cindy, and they're having a fight. Something's going on, and they are, they've built walls up, and they've said, I'm, not going to, I'm never going to be reconciled to you. I don't agree with you. I don't like you. You did X, Y, or Z. And these walls have gone up. And in the middle of the worship service, the pastor says, I am begging. I'm begging you to be reconciled. And I believe that when Paul goes on in verse 4, 4 through 9, that he tells them how. He says, this is how you can prepare the way for reconciliation to take place. Because just telling two people to be reconciled when walls are up and they're angry and they're frustrated and they don't want to go there gets you nowhere. But in Jesus, an exchange can take place. We're going to have to make some conscious decisions to say we're willing to exchange some of this rubble for a road. So let's talk about how. Philippians chapter 4, let's look just at verse 4. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. First thing that we're going to have to exchange if we're going to come to a place of being able to see these walls become a road is retaliation for rejoicing. The fact of the matter is that if somebody does something I don't like, they hurt me or people I love or I just think that they did, my go-to response is I'm going to retaliate. One way or the other. Either I am going to throw things at you. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to say things about you. I'm going to gather a group of people together and tell them, do you know that this person did such and such? I'm retaliating. I'll pull away. Some of us do we retaliate by just rejecting. We withdraw relationship completely and totally. And our point, plain and simple, is we're putting a wall up. Do you catch what Paul says, though? He says the first time that there's conflict between two people, when, I'm, when I sense and the anger comes and I've watched a relationship go to rubble, he says the first thing I'm to do is to rejoice. Do you know that has just never been my first motive? Never, not one time have I come and said, oh great, we're having a fight. But if I will stop, and remember, I think these are steps we take before you and I try to reconcile. So if I will go back and I will take a step away and say, Lord, I am choosing, and boy, is it a choice, to rejoice, not in this situation, but in you. To come and say, Lord, today I claim the reality and the fact that you're still God, even though this took place. I believe that you're still good. Lord, I rejoice in the fact that you love me, even though I'm part of why we are in this situation. I believe, Lord, that you love this person, and I choose to rejoice in that. Did you know it is utterly impossible to build a wall that separates you from God when you're rejoicing in his presence? Come before the Lord and begin to celebrate who he is, and that wall, it starts to come down. If I come before the Lord and I begin to rejoice that you have a plan, that you can move, you can take what is a mess right now, and you promise you will use it for good, it starts to become possible to take down the wall that separates me from the person who I'm really upset with. But I start with rejoicing. Now that's going to look different for different people. For me, when I get super stressed and I'm upset and I'm anxious about somebody because I really do not care for conflict and I know that I'm supposed to go to them and I do not like that, I clean like nobody's business. You ever walk into my office and it's actually clean? It was a bad week. But while cleaning, I will blast my favorite worship music. And I force myself to sing. I force myself to listen to that and stop thinking what I'm thinking. For some people, they get in the Word and they just begin to pray or they begin to read. I don't know how you're going to do it, what's the best way for you to rejoice in the Lord, but I'll tell you this, it is going to be the first thing you need to do. Before you're planning on going and having a chat with your spouse for the thing that just really irritated you, go away, and spend some time rejoicing in the Lord. Because it starts to take the rubble and turn it into a road. Let's keep going. Verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all, because the Lord is near. 
After we exchange retaliation for rejoicing, we're going to have to be willing to exchange callousness for Christ-likeness. When we get hurt, we get angry, we get upset with somebody, all of a sudden, we build, we build walls because we become pretty callous. We get callous towards the other person. I'm not showing you forgiveness if my life depended on it. We get harsh in our hearts in the ways that we speak about them, in the ways that we talk about them to other people. We go hard. Paul says, no, 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 let your gentleness be seen in this. Gentleness can also be translated as your generosity, your large-heartedness, your compassion. You know, when, when I sin and my Savior looks at me, he doesn't harden and say, yeah, today I'm just gonna reject you. He looks at me with incredible compassion, generosity, and he speaks the most gentle words. He says, Kelly, you sinned, but he invites me to be changed. When we start thinking about other people, my tendency, and I hear it reflected in many people, certainly in the woman that was in my office this week, she was furious. And as those walls are going up, only thing she had to say about the people who had done this was how awful they are. So we started to talk said, I wonder if there's more going on in their world than you're aware of. Do you know that you've heard the adage, hurt people hurt people? Well, part of letting our gentleness be evident to all is being willing to be humble enough to say, when I'm hurting, I hurt people. And I wonder if that person is hurting. I wonder if there's more going on in their world. It doesn't excuse what they did, but it might give us an explanation. Part of allowing gentleness to be seen by all is being willing to say, the way I talk about what happened, I'm going to call it what it is, but begin to ask some questions. I'm going to show generosity in my spirit. I, I, I'm going to not assume the worst about them as a human being. Maybe there's more to this story than what I realize. You know, the more that I do that, the more the wall comes down. Because I start to think, maybe there's more to this story than I know. I'll end up starting to pray for that person and say, Lord, Lord, what's going on in their world? Paul says, let your gentleness be known by everybody, not just to the people that you like today, (laughs) but to everyone, even the person on the other side of that wall, because the Lord is near. You know, think about that in two ways. One, one day Jesus is in fact going to return. He is going to show up. And I don't want him to show up and the words coming out of my mouth right at that moment being the hardest things I could possibly think about this person I'm irritated with. The second part of that reality is he really is near. Like he's right here. He hears every word that I speak and I can come to Jesus and talk to him about the person he loves. You know that changes how you speak? If you were having a fight with, uh, uh, with somebody's wife and you came to the husband and you wanted to discuss, oh, here we go, Brandon. If I had a fight with Ashley and I was upset about something that she did and I want to discuss it with Brandon, I'm going to choose gentle words. And I'm not going to look at him out of somebody that I care about and respect and say, I'm just going to explain to you that I think your wife stinks. When I come to Jesus and I'm talking to him about the person I'm upset with, you're talking to the groom about his bride. It'll change how you talk if I start to think he's near and I go from callousness to Christ-likeness. Verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're talking about a third exchange. We're going to talk about exchanging protection. And in reality, that should read false protection for real peace. When I get hurt by somebody else, the reason the walls go up is because I'm trying to protect myself. Protect me from you doing it again. Sometimes I'm protecting me from feeling 
Anger is one of the best defense mechanisms. It will keep you from being sad if you just stay angry. It will keep you from having to look inward. Just stay angry. It will keep you from transforming anything. Just stay angry. The more I put up those walls, the more I'm trying to protect myself. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, you did such and such, and my self-defense mechanisms go way up, even if they're right, I don't want to think that way. So Paul says, when I start to sense those walls going up, and I'm going into self-protection mode, he says, stop for a second. You can't protect yourself anyhow. What would happen if instead I start to bring the fears of what could happen and the worries and the anxiety that this stressful situation is causing me and I bring them to him? Like instead of stewing, instead of telling the whole world or working out a strategy for how to get those walls higher, what if I just prayed and prayed and prayed every time I want to put the walls up? I said, Lord, I believe that you're working in this. God, I believe that you're bigger than this. Do you know what will happen? Paul says it. He says, the peace of God will guard you. The word in Greek literally says the peace of God will will become a garrison around you. A garrison is a troop, right? It's like God's peace comes about me like this whole uh, part of the army that surrounds me. He can protect me in ways nobody else can. And that lets the walls come down. You know, sometimes I don't want to go and talk to people because I know I did something wrong. But if I start to take those walls down, I come before the Lord and say, God, I know I did this, and I'm so sorry, but I don't want to tell them. Do you know the Lord begins to speak to me and says, hey, Kelly, I forgive you and I still love you. There's a peace that comes by knowing that I am loved by Jesus Christ no matter my part in that problem that makes it so I can go to the person and just own it. There's a peace that comes from being able to say, Lord, I believe you are bigger than whatever this fight is. I believe that you can solve it. I believe, God, that you have good on the other side of this that makes it so walls can come down. The peace of God can guard me better than I'm ever going to. But that means that way before I start talking to you, I need to be talking to Jesus, bringing all those fears to him. Let's look at the next one. Verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I love that verse. It gets quoted all the time, almost never in context. (laughs) I think our fourth exchange is hostility for honesty. Sometimes when we get angry, and, and uh, elbows to yourself, some of us, when we get angry with somebody, the only thing we can see is what they've done wrong. Period. That's why we name people by their sin. We say that is all they are. Or my personal favorite, you always, listen, no human being is consistent enough ever to always do something. We're just not that smart. We start to look at people and say, this is what they always do, this is who they always are. Some of us get historical instead of hysterical in fights, right? You just dredge everything up from the past, every bad thing. Nobody ever gets historical and is like, let me list all of your good qualities. But that's what Paul's asking us to do. He says, before I even think about being reconciled to you, because if all I can think about is all of your bad qualities, Why would I want to be reconciled? So Paul says, if there's anything at all that is good, that is praiseworthy in this other human being, anything, they love their mom, anything, think about that. Now he is not saying, and we'll talk about this in the weeks to come, ignore what they did wrong, because you can't be reconciled unless you acknowledge rubble. But I also cannot be reconciled unless I'm willing to say, there's some reason. You're not 100% evil. There's something good about this person or this relationship. There was once some reason why we were connected. And as I begin to exchange the flat old hostility for honesty that sees both good and bad, then the road can get built. Last one, verse 9. 
Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This last exchange is playing for presence. Some of us, we, we play at being Christians. So we play at it. We want Jesus to forgive us, but not the person we're angry with. We want to be reconciled to God, but ugh, we don't want to be reconciled to other people. We play. And Paul says, do it. Put this into practice. Stop playing and start actually working out those relationships. It's messy and it's hard. It's not easy. But it is what gets us to the cross. Paul made a remarkable comment at the end of verse 9, right? He says, whatever you have seen me do, you model it and you go do it. Stop playing. Put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Now, there is a promise in that, friends. There's a promise that says reconciliation is a hard road. It's a long road. It's not always easy to walk. But if I will go down that road, I go with God. Like he doesn't look at us and say, hey, good luck figuring this out. He looks and says, I will walk with you absolutely every step of the way. But you know, he can only walk down the road that we're willing to build. Period. The reality is that these five pieces, you know, for some of us, or some of us, you look at them and you, know, I, I, you see the world through rose-colored glasses. So for some of you, number four, not that big of a deal. You're like, I only ever see the good in people. God bless you. Someone should. But my guess is that there's another one up there that you struggle with. For all of us, there's some piece of this that is hard to do. And my guess is you can think of a relationship right now where the walls have gone up. The only way those walls are going to come down and the rubble get turned into a road that makes it possible for us to walk to Jesus is if we do the pre-work. This is before reconciliation. This is before you even connect with the other person. This is our internal responsibility that builds the road so we can be reconciled. And the truth of the matter is that even though it's a very difficult thing for us to do, it is completely possible. I'm not going to read this whole passage to you, but I'd encourage you to look it up. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 20, right, is where Paul says, you and I, through Jesus, are now new creation. So guess what that means? It means all the old habits of wall building, when relationships get turned into rubble, they're old. They are gone. In Jesus Christ, it is possible to do it new. And you know Why? Because Paul goes on to say, you and I have been reconciled. He goes on to say that God the Father sent God the Son to obliterate the wall of our sin that separated us from him. And he built a road. He built a road that he says you and I can walk on that brings us straight to the cross. That when we come to this cross, we are reconciled. God exchanges hell for heaven. He exchanges our sin for Jesus' righteousness. That exchange has taken place. If you're a Christian today, you are the beneficiary of it. And Paul goes on, and he says, okay, Christian, if everything has been made new, and this is new because God reconciled you, God has now entrusted you with me, with the ministry of reconciliation. What the gospel looks like is being a people who are willing to come just like Jesus did and say whatever it takes to knock down the walls and build the, wall, build the road so that people, even the person we're most upset with right now, that we can together walk to Jesus, then that's what we're called to live. So before we even talk about, so how do I go to this person? and How do we have these conversations? We have to start here. So my challenge for each one of us this week, oh, well, i got to go backwards. Can you give me that list of five again, Mr. Brandon? The challenge for each one of us is to put this into practice. This is not about going and talking to the person whom you need to be reconciled with. This is about you talking to the Lord. About saying, God, I exchange retaliation for rejoicing, callousness for Christ-likeness, protection for peace, hostility for honesty, playing for your presence. So that when we come back here next Sunday, 
we come back as a people who say, okay, with the Lord, I'm taking down the walls and I'm trying to build a road so we can start the conversation about how do we walk on it. Let's pray together. This morning, as you come before your Savior, I invite you to respond, respond to the one who has reconciled you. If you need to come this morning and say, Jesus, that sounds really hard, tell him. If you need to come this morning and say, Lord, I need you to change my heart so I'd be willing to turn the rubble into a road. And ask him to do that. And if you're ready, come this morning and say, Lord, with this person, I'm committing to taking those five steps. Jesus, thank you for meeting us where we are. So Lord, if today we stand between two walls, cut off from you and cut off from uh, other people, I thank you that you meet us right here. Lord, I ask for every one of my brothers and sisters here today that you would empower us and equip us to take bold steps, Lord, that by your grace, rubble can be built into a road. Lord, I thank you that you will walk with us every one of those steps, that you will be present uh, when we find the victory of seeing walls come down, and you will be present, Lord, when we struggle to be willing to remove the bricks. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for doing all the work so that we can be reconciled. Now we trust that as you entrust us with this ministry, Lord, we would continue to see you move. God, we ask these things in your name. Amen.